Uh, I felt that we haven't had theory and diagrams enough recently <laughs> in the Nordic LARP talks. So I thought I would, I would um, cap this evening, I, I don't dare to say crown this evening, but cap this evening before we move to the Q&A with some exciting diagrams that you can watch in PowerPoint. Um, the, my headline is Designing Your Thing, Your Thing, Their Experience, and Our Culture. Um, and I'm going to talk about LARP design tonight, uh, but it's good to remember that actually what I'm saying here is a applicable to almost any kind of experience, performance, or service. So when I say your thing, I'm going to talk about your LARP, but your thing could be something else. It could be a concert, it could be a, a theatrical performance, it could be you shining somebody's shoes for money. Uh, all of those things would be applicable, your thing. And as creators, as creatives, as makers of things, as designers, we want to do our thing, the thing that we create. We want to do it as well as humanly possible. And what the Knudfunk tradition has given us uh, in the Nordic community and internationally is a lot of language and uh, thinking patterns to be able to do LARP design really well. We sometimes fail, but fundamentally, between us as a community of a few thousand people who are practicing, practicing this tradition, we know how to do this. We've figured out how to make LARPs, and that's like a small list of what you need. Basically, like world characters, relationships, setting, culture, some simulation mechanics, like not actually killing each other, some interaction mechanics, like playing nice together, and how, rules, agency, costume, sets, something along those lines. You just do that thing really well, and then you have a really good LARP. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> and I think we got to that point pretty early. I mean, it's may somewhere between, let's say, maybe seven years ago, maybe ten years ago, we got to a hit rate where the really good LARPs were consistently good, never flawless. You could always, you know, we, c we keep learning from each other. But the good stuff was really good. But it wasn't good enough. And we spent a lot of time thinking about like, the, the wrong paths we've gone on. We thought, oh, can we build, if we build a perfect illusion, will it be the perfect LARP? No. Okay, if we build the most gripping sort of narrative setting, will that be the perfect LARP? No. If we write the longest character descriptions, no. <laughs> so on. Um, so we had, to, we had to think again, what, why isn't it working? If I'm designing the perfect LARP and everybody knows Everybody who understands this stuff understands that this should work, and it doesn't work. What can it be? What's the problem? And what we realized was that when we were talking about LARP design, what we quite often really meant was runtime design. So runtime is the period when your LARP is actually running. Like It doesn't have a strict definition, but let's say it's while characters are being played. That's the runtime of your LARP. That's when people are playing it, right? And of course, that's the focus of your thing. So, we had been really focused, as a tradition, on, on these kinds of questions, like what will happen in my LARP? Or what will the participants be doing? And these are core design questions, especially what will my participants be doing? You have to be able to answer that in a coherent fashion to make a good LARP. However, it turned out that it isn't quite enough, because we thought that if I just decide perfectly what the LARP will be, and what the people will do, then they will actually do that. And that is not how humans work, my friend. And I don't mean just that people don't necessarily want to do the exact thing that I've envisioned. Like, it, that's also a problem. But I envision something and maybe the people don't want to do that thing. But it's also that they might not actually know how to do that thing. Now, if you've ever played a video game of, of any kind, and actually, again, like, not the early video games, because they didn't actually do this, but pretty soon video games figured out that for people to actually play a video game, the video game needs to teach you how to play the video game. So now, typically, that's the first thing a game will do. It will either teach you explicitly through a tutorial or implicitly through being structured in a way that when you start exploring it, your actions, your interactions with the game will teach you how to play it. And, of course, the same thing is true for most games. Uh, if you buy a big contemporary board game, it's going to have a, an, um, a manual, and it's going to take maybe an hour to set up, and at least an hour to read the manual, and, or you know, two hours for somebody to explain the rules to you, and then you can play. And that's just expected as par for the course. But if you buy a chess set, 
you very rarely get a manual that explains how to play chess. Now, why is this? Sorry? Cultural traditions, yes. And somebody said everybody knows how to play chess. Yes. Now, of course, that's a blatant lie. Not everybody knows how to play chess. How do we learn? Yeah, we learn through tradition. Chess is a game that is traditionally taught and has been for thousands of years through some kind of apostolic succession. So people who sell chess games may think that everybody will automatically, like if you are on the market for a chess game set, it's because somebody has taught you to play chess. Now this may be culturally true, but that doesn't mean that you actually know. Uh, you're not born, it's not a genetic human condition knowing how to play chess. And in fact, uh, I guess <laughs> like one big takeaway is that there's no such thing as implicit knowledge or, or like an implicit interface or normal behavior. Your participants in your thing will always need to be taught how to read, uh, how, to do, how to interact with this thing. For instance, a book. We all take pretty much for granted how a book works. Like we know how to engage with a book. And a book, when you think about it, is a really participatory thing. You have to do a lot of work for the story to come alive. Uh, and then the manga comics boom happens in the West, and everybody has to relearn how to read, so that this is a, a directions page. If this is your first time reading a manga style, here's a quick guide to help you understand how it works. And that would be printed on the last page, culturally speaking, from the West, uh, on the book, so that you can do it. And then if you read uh, Western manga, big th things, and that is printed in the traditional Western reading order, then on the last page it will say, stop, what are you doing? This is the kind of book you should be reading the proper way around. <laughs> N you can take nothing for granted, right? Um, so, we're pretty bad at communicating our, the visions that are inside our heads. And also, our LARPs got more and more ambitious, so the workload of communicating everything that was inside our head got increasingly complex. And also, the workload of actually producing all of those things that create the runtime were, was far too much for organizers. So it also became, in the Nordic tradition, a hurdle that you needed to divide the labor a little bit and let the participants carry more of the design work. And similarly, Many of the games that we made had more and more engaged with more and more complex topics, so the needs for aftercare of different kinds was also growing. And at some point, we realized that, of course, that means that a lot of the stuff that's happening in the runtime isn't actually operating in the runtime. It's happening, it's established before, when the game is teaching you how to teach, how to interact with this game, with this LARP. Uh, or afterwards, when, you, when the community of players of this specific run, of this specific thing, are figuring out what they have just experienced. So a few years ago, we basically redefined what LARP designed means. It used to mean designing what's happening in the runtime, and now, in our parlance, LARP design means designing the full LARP, which includes what we sometimes call the paralarp. That's, that is to say, the practices, designs, and texts that happen before and after the runtime to enable the playing of your LARP for that specific group of people. Problem solved? <laughs> no, no. Because weirdly, you could make the perfect LARP. You would design the perfect LARP, and you would design the perfect workshop and the perfect aftercare, and there were still players who were not happy, and there were still LARPs that did not work, and sometimes it's poor craftsmanship, but sometimes it really isn't poor craftsmanship, and it still goes to shits. And now why is that? So we looked closer at that, and we realized that there were so many things that could still go wrong, even if you have this process in place. Uh, I, I see now that in this, on the, on this wall it's difficult to see what, the, what's, what it says on the, on the lighter. So I, before the runtime it says handouts, workshops, relationships, logistics. Those are just examples of stuff that you need to achieve for LARP to work. And then during the runtime it says off-game room. That would be a typical non-run, non-in-game thing that, that is provided often. And above it it says meta stuff. That could be stuff like meta techniques, where the players are interacting with each other outside of character, for instance, during actor breaks or fluidly during the LARP. And afterwards, it says de rolling debrief stories. Uh, yeah, you can do all of this perfectly, and some many, many things can go wrong. But I'm just going to give you a few different examples. One thing that could go wrong is that the wrong players show up. 
By this, I don't mean the people who haven't paid, but I mean the people who are not going to enjoy this LARP no matter what. This is a big problem, and it happens surprisingly often. When people are unhappy at your LARP, it's sometimes because you're shit, but also sometimes it's because you got the wrong players to sign up. And it's your fault, it's not their fault. Another thing that can happen, and it's not fun at all, of course, is that a, play a player becomes the victim of sexual harassment during your thing. Or a much less dramatic, but uh, quite uh, powerful, sad experience could be that a new player comes along, new to your community or new to the form, and they don't get play. They don't become integrated in the action of your thing in a natural way. Um, so, suddenly we need to think about before and after. There's something we can talk about, expectation management. So, if this is going to sound so banal, but it's really important. If people are disappointed in your thing, it's always relative to their expectation, always. So, it means that when they arrive to your thing and they are disappointed, it's too late to do anything about it because the problem happened before they even got there, when, when their expectations became that they would get something else, right? And then at the other end of the time, time thing, you have memories and legacy. So if somebody has a really bad experience at your, at your LARP, even if it's for, relationship, for reasons that are not necessarily your fault, that's going to affect the legacy of the experience and certainly dominate their memories and possibly the memories of everybody else who participated in this thing. So it can, I mean, and I, th I think expectation management mostly our fault as organizers, but other things can happen. And they're not our fault, but they're still our responsibility. And even more importantly, if you want to be crass, they're our problem. So if somebody else, like something goes bad at your LARP, may not be your fault, but it's absolutely your problem. Okay. So now at this point, a lot of people will just shrug and go like, well, it's the world, it is terrible, and sometimes you don't get what you want, and then you move on. We, of course, are game designers, so we're going to design the hell out of this thing. So you look at, this, at the thing and then you go, ah, oh, I noticed that the expectation management is happening outside the circle and most of the memories and legacy making is bleeding. It certainly is built during the de-rolling debrief and the stories when we collectively decide what's happened. But that also goes into, I think we need another circle in this diagram. Yes! <laughs> yes! So we have now learned that the things that happen during the runtime is affected and controlled by everything that is communicated and, and acted before the LARP even starts, stuff, or before the runtime even starts, stuff like handouts and workshops, right? And also we know that the effect and the memory and the legacy of your LARP is designed and affected and created through the things that you have decided happen after. And if you don't decide what happens, the players decide what happens, and that will usually not be aligned with your goals, so make active choices. But unexpectedly, or by this point, if you've been listening, totally expectedly, it turns out that what happens in that second circle is completely shaped and affected by the third circle, the wider circle. And now I just, for the simplicity's sake, I just call it culture. Our culture, it's several kinds of culture. It's the culture of the potential and actual players of your, of your LARP. It's also the, the wider LARP culture that these players are a part of, and if you run for international people, it means all of the LARP cultures that those people engage with enter that circle, and they are not coherent. And beyond that, there's, of course, yet another circle that is the, the culture in which we live, which is not the same all over the world in all classes and so on. So intersectionality comes into this also. The experience of, of living in a culture is different depending on your body and many other things. So in the outermost circle, suddenly we have things like player selection. That's a design activity, by the way. Who comes to your LARP is selected by them and by you before the experience even starts. There's going to be some process in place for that, or the wrong people will show up. Hype, media, social scripts. How do we behave in specific situations? Norms, helping out, communities, standards of care, performing friendship, like what are the acts that we do to show that we're friendly and friendship, friends with each other, traditions, lingo, in-jokes, rituals, nostalgia. And up there I have written the away audience, because these days if somebody's running a LARP, there's a lot of people on social media 
following the LARP. I mean, maybe this is a very niche thing, but I certainly do it. I can tell you that at Convention of Thorns, which is a vampire LARP running in Poland right now, they have started briefing just over an hour ago. And when they stop play, I will stay up late at night and keep refreshing my Facebook feed to start to get the first responses, and I'm not even there. And I'm not the only person who does this. And my reactions to that will also shape the legacy of that LARP. And it might also shape, weirdly, how some of the people who are playing that LARP experience their own experience. So you can't separate any of this stuff from the second circle. Yes. And norms and media and everything in the culture is really important for what happens in, for instance, those three cases that I mentioned, stuff that can go wrong. So player selection. How is it decided what games are interesting and cool in the, your culture? Are there very many LARPs to choose from? Or will people just go to whichever LARPs are available and seem good? Can the players that you want afford your LARP? How does your status play into to who comes to your LARP? And how does hype attach itself to your LARP? Because when hype attaches itself to your LARP, you are not in charge of deciding of, of expectation management, somebody else is, like a vague, vague collective of other people is deciding what people coming to your LARP expect. Sometimes we encourage hype because we need to sell tickets. That's a really bad design practice. <laughs> because then you lose control of their expectations and you need to design their expectations. Uh, or if we take uh, the case of sexual harassment, for instance, then, what is the norms of how we in the community, in the specific player community and the wider player community, engage with each other and how we take care of each other? Uh, and this actually also goes into the whole getting play thing for the beginners or the newcomers. How do we interact with people we don't know? Have we designed an inclusive culture? Do we speak before and after the event to people we don't know? That you have to design intentionally because if you don't design it intentionally, the players will bring whatever they have. right? And maybe you know that you have a really warm and friendly culture, but those people have never played Arkham Horror before, so to speak. Or nobody taught them chess, and everybody's walking around like, I'm gonna move my queen over here. Like, no. <laughs> I'm gonna be isolated and afraid, and also possibly a target uh, for a predator. How does stage status work? How does culture of party, what is the culture of partying in your culture? How do we negotiate intimacy? especially after the thing, because we know that LARPs create a very powerful intimacy between complete strangers, because we've, create, we've shared these powerful stories together. What is our cultural practice for negotiating that intimacy after? Do we hug everybody? Often. Not everybody is cool with that. We can make intentional decisions about that that will affect what kinds of experiences people will have, which in case, which uh, um, will, ex uh, ex which will affect what kinds of experiences they have of our LARPs, what kinds of play is available to them during the runtime. Problem solved? <laughs> Probably not. I, I think this is a thing that never ends, especially when you get to things like, ah, oh, we need to solve all problems of class and status at all intersections in the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, that's hard, but in the bubble, like whatever the bubble is, you actually have a lot more control uh, than you think. So I, s I have talked today about designing your thing, and that's where our heart is. Like, I just want my thing to be great, and why can't they all be the exact same kind of people that I am so that they can just do it? But they're not, <laughs> you know? I want somebody else to come to my thing. Otherwise, I could be writing novels and not publishing them, you know? <laughs> So I'm, I'm making my thing, but for my thing to reach anyone, I also have to think about their experience. And for their experience to be meaningful and good and positive and powerful and transforming or just fun, we need to think about our culture. And the arrow at the bottom is a timeline. So every time you make a LARP, or every time you gather people in a room like this, we iterate what is our culture, what is our culture, what is our culture, what is our culture. And we should do that in a way that is aware, because that is design, and design is the opposite, opposite of tradition. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to say at the end uh, that I am the CEO of a company called Participation Design Agency. Our webpage is, I kid you not, participation.design. Uh, but I also have a LARP safety blog, 
that you should check out on participationsafety.wordpress.com that uh, I write all the time, a couple of times a month about this kind of thing. And I would love feedback and questions and specific ideas. So talk to me about that. Very good.